Um, again, thanks everyone for coming, and let's get started. So I assume that most people who are coming to this webinar knows a little bit about raw data, but we're just going to give a brief background um, about the benefits and challenges of using raw spectroscopy. So the benefits are that it's a non-destructive uh, technique that requires minimal sample preparation. It's used often in, say, pharmaceuticals to look at raw materials coming in, um, so you can get a quick check to make sure that it is what it says it is on the way in, because we don't always trust our vendors, right? Um, and you can very easily integrate ramen into your processes. Um, because it's a non-destructive technique and it can be a little bit standoff, so it's very easy to integrate into your processes. It doesn't affect anything else that's going on. And it can provide some enhanced chemical information over NIR. Um, so some of the benefits of, NIR, of RAMEN as well is that your spectra are very highly featured. So you can do some analysis um, directly on the raw data, you'll see you don't really need very much pre-processing from Raman data, which is pretty fantastic because you've got your fundamental uh, vibrations that you're looking at here as opposed to NIR where you're looking at your overtones and your combination bands. So you directly looking at your data, it doesn't things don't stand out quite as easily um, without doing some really serious pre-processing. The challenges are it can be highly affected by fluorescence. If you have any part of your sample that fluoresces, if you don't use the proper wavelength, what you'll see is a very um, strange baseline. You'll still see your uh, features, but it'll be underneath this or on top of this um, baseline that can be a little bit difficult to identify. Um, the laser itself can destroy the sample. if its power is too high. So you do have to be a little careful about that with your focus and the strength of your laser. And so because of these two things, you may require several modes of operations or different wavelengths to cover all your applications. Um, so a lot of Raman spectrometers will have a tunable laser, um, so you can use one or two or three different wavelengths to get around this fluorescence issue. So with multivariate data analysis on spectroscopic data, um, what you use this for, you can use it for exploratory data analysis and classification. So you might want to say different raw materials, so different types of media, for example, um, and we'll go through one of those kinds of examples. And it allows you to classify what you're looking at. That's good for your uh, incoming materials identification. Another way you can use your spectroscopic data um, plus a laboratory reference data is you can build some regression models for predictions. So this allows you to replace expensive or destructive testing. In the pharmaceutical world, you're looking at, say, HPLC, where you're trying to look at the degradance of your product or your how much of your actual active drug ingredient is in your tablets, for example. Um, and because you can replace this, and ramen is so fast, you get your analysis in seconds rather than hours or weeks, and it saves you a lot of time and money in getting your inventory out. Um, lots of different multivariate tools that you can use. Um, design of experiments, this is going to be early on in your methods if you're trying to uh, get your optimum process going. Um, exploratory data analysis, that tends to be where people start because you've already generated a ton of data and you want to know what it is. Um, how do I take all this large data and bring it down into a manageable uh, size and visualizations that I can explain to other people? Uh, we talked briefly about classification, discrimination, so you might have, you want to know if something's within a group or without a group, or you might have multiple types of things, and so you want to identify which group something falls into. And then we've got the regression and prediction, which predicts important attributes for new samples, or you can use these sometimes for um, process control, multivariate process control. Uh, this is just a general workflow of when you're doing multivariate data analysis. Um, you need to make sure that you collect your data um, you, and that you're sampling your acquisition isn't adding any extra noise to your sample. 
and then you check your data, you take a look at it, um, you build your model, whether that's a classification or a regression model, um, and then you check your model, you validate it, make sure that it's internally consistent and externally consistent, and then you apply it to new samples, and you have your statistics from these other, uh, from this validation step to say how confident you are in applying that to your new data. And then once you get your model, then you can move forward and replace your previous methods. So there's some fun things that we can do in Unscambler to help you handle your data sets. Um, when you have spectroscopic data, you often have your spectrum, and then you also have either groupings or analytical data that corresponds with that, and you're able to, in the Unscrambler, make what we call uh, column sets. So you can separate out, this is my uh, Y that I'm trying to predict, these are my spectra I'm trying to use to predict that. Um, if you know there's a specific region that is most important, you can highlight that region and only use that region. Um, so that's very handy in here as well. One thing we offer also is once you have made one of these column sets, you want to define it as spectra. So you go in your column set, you right click, and you say that it's spectra. And what that does is it changes the default uh, plotting of the unscrambler to, for certain plots to line plots. Uh, this is important in your loadings when you're doing principal components or a, a regression model so that um, it makes sense. So all of your individual variables are related to each other in a way that you want to make sure that it still looks like a spectrum. And just doing points doesn't do that. We can also identify category variables if you're trying to do some uh, classification methods. And one of our biggest things is remember, always visualize before you analyze. Plotting your data is essential to any data analysis, um, whether it's simple or complex. It's amazing the things that you can spot very quickly in a line graph that um, you wouldn't see if you're just looking at your data uh, in the numbers or if you just dive right ahead and go into your multivariate data analysis. Um, you want to keep those extra random noise out as much as possible. This is just an example of that. This is NAR data. But you can see here that you have a one spectrum that's very different from the rest. It's much more noisy. It stands out. It's probably not representative of your, um, of your samples. So you want to make sure to remove that before you do anything else. Let me go ahead and open up the unscrambler. Get it on the right screen here. I close that. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to first show you some process data um, that we've got from Kaiser was uh, very generous to share some data with us. And I'm going to show you, we have a lot of vendor-specific uh, file formats that we can bring in. So we have their propriety format. So it's very easy to pull data into the Unscrambler, even if you have something that's maybe a little strange. Um, and if there's something ever, just keep in mind that we don't have currently that you use, talk to us. We're happy to work with those companies and try to get them in here. So what I have actually is some SPC files, some grams data, and I'm going to go through here. And what I'm going to do is just go to the folder where I'm holding my data. And all of the files that match this format, SPC format, will show up here. Now, 
what I can do is I click on one of these. I can auto-select all the matching spectra. So every spectrum that is in this folder that has the same number of X variables, so that's the same number of wavelengths, and also has the same starting X and the final X, um, I can automatically select them. So if you have 300 spectra, you don't have to go in and individually select them all. Now certain instruments have a little issue sometimes with their wavelengths where they'll be slightly off from each other. So this first X might actually be for one of these 100.003. Um, but it's essentially the same wavelength. What you can do to get around that, because as it stands, those would not automatically select, you can hit this interpolate. So it interpolates the spectra of the axis of the first reference that you selected. And it moves a little slight adjustments to bring everything this so that it actually plots the same way. We don't need to do that in this case because it all lines up. I want to go under sample naming and include my file name so that I know what these replicates are. We so, say OK, and then we're going to bring that in. I've got this dummy uh, column that I'm just going to go ahead and remove. Now here's our Raman data for all my data sets. Now these are um, process data for, um, for a company that was trying to look at, it's a component where they know, they measure two different components and add a third component to make a mixture to bring it up to 100% um, based on what's already in the mixture. <clears throat> so what we want to do is they've taken three replicates, so we have one A, one B, one C. So the first thing I want to do in this particular case is I'm going to average these. The way we do that is under Tasks, Transform, come down to Reduce, Average. It looks like a little mean symbol that we're all used to. It's going to be all columns, and in this particular case, we're going to reduce along our samples. Because um, we have three replicates of samples, we're going to go to this reduction factor and up that to three. Now, it's important in this particular case that you have three replicates of every single sample. If there's one that has four or one that has two, it's going to kind of mess everything up. So you need to make sure that your data is consistent in this case. Um, if you use the sample index, you can look for terms like this, 1A, 1B, 1C, then 2A, 2B. Um, so there's a way to kind of get around that, but we're just going to do this for now. Say OK. And now we have a new data matrix that says that it has been reduced. So we have 20 full samples. So let's take a quick look at this data just to make sure that everything looks good. We don't have any strange outliers. And this is exactly what I would expect for, from some Raman data. Um, we see it's a pretty fat, flat baseline that's pretty common for Raman data unless you have that fluorescence. So there's no real fluorescence in this case. Now, at this point, I don't have any analytical information in here at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I actually have some analytical information that's in an Excel file. And the great thing about this is that we can actually just copy and paste directly from Excel into the Unscrambler. So we've got our analytical data is product A, B, and C in grams plus water. And then based on what the amounts of product A and B are, they add product C and water to come up to around 15 grams. So I'm going to copy this data. Oh, I only need 20 because I have 20 samples here. Um, you can copy however you like, control C, right click, copy, um, it doesn't matter. And then what we're going to do here is under here we're going to say insert. We're 
we can insert copied cells. And you see it brings it right in, and it looks like it's off by one. So let me fix that. Oh, it's because I had the text data in there as well. So I still have it copied. Um, if I paste from here, then it automatically updates. And we've got everything, all our labels at the top, and our data is in here. <clears throat> now, to do some analyses, I want to separate out what these different things are. So I'm going to highlight everything that's not spectra. Press this little gray box that says Define Range. We're going to say Spectra here. And there's a button that allows me to select the opposite. So right now I have everything that is not spectra selected. If I say that, and now I get 11 through the end, and I'm going to create that as the spectra. Now the two things I care about um, for analysis is going to be product A. Create one of those, and product B. Now I have my column ranges, we press OK, and you'll see there's a little bit uh, column sets here. We want to go to the spectra, right click on there, and Unscrambler sometimes is smart and will automatically select it as spectra for you. But just make sure if you have spectra to go and check and make sure that that is checked. All right. <clears throat> so. We look at our line plot, and you can see everything looks pretty consistent down at these uh, shorter wavelengths. And then you've got a little bit extra noise, maybe a variation in the higher wavelengths. So that tells me that there might be some scattering effects in here. So what I'm going to do is go under Tasks, Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, look at my spectra. Okay. Um, now this shows me my box plots for the um, each individual variable. So it shows you the max, the min, and the um, the median and the quartiles in there. But what I really want to look at is if I right click in here, we can go to statistics, scatter effects. And what this does is it takes each individual sample, in this case, sample 1B, and plots it versus the mean spectrum. I don't really care too much about individual samples. I care about how they all look with each other. So we're going to press all. And now what we see is a very classic fanning. Um, it looks like they have a general... Uh, similar trends, there's not too much off, but we have much less variability in down here, and we see a big change up here. Now that's very indicative of a uh, multiplicative scattering effect, um, and there's different kinds of scattering effects. You can have additive effects, and that would be consistent across the entire uh, wavelength region, and what you would see then is that everything has the same slope, it's just offset from each other. And you can correct those things by doing something like a derivative or a uh, just a simple baseline correction, but when you have something that the scattering is different depending on the wavelength, you need to do some preprocessing that takes care of these multiplicative effects. One of those um, is a standard normal variant. So that's what I would see this, and the first thing I would try and apply is this SNV. So we're going to go under Tasks, Transform, SNV. Make sure we click our spectra. And if you want, you can actually preview your results. Um, this is more important, I think, when you're looking at derivatives and you're looking at um, how many points you want to smooth and things like that. And you can see what the effects are. This is the original spectra, and then these are the transformed spectra. So you see it brings down that variability in these wavelengths pretty well. Now, in particular cases, you might not want to do this. For example, if you are trying to model particle size, particle size is one of the reasons why you have 
different um, multiplicative scattering effects um, at different wavelengths. And if you actually, your information you wanted was your particle size, you might not want to get rid of that, those scattering effects. Um, so you need to keep in mind what your analysis is and what information you care about getting out. So now let's take a look again and plot our spectra. I always just like to take a look at it and see what it is. And now it looks like we have pretty clean data. It doesn't look too noisy, so I may not do any real smoothing. Um, that's kind of up to you if you want to do that. And there's a fairly flat baseline. So if you had a reflectance baseline, what you would see is this would kind of curve up and then plateau out. And there is a transformation that you can do called detrending that helps fit a polynomial under that curve um, to get rid of some of that. So now I just want to take another look at this data and so the next step I would do is do um, a principal components analysis. I always do this even if I'm planning on doing a regression model just to kind of get a, an idea of what I'm looking at. Um, make sure there's no gross outliers in, in that um, we're going to do full cross-validation because we are less than 30 samples, that is fine. And we don't need to weight our data because, again, this is spectroscopic data. Let this chug away. Great. So the first thing we want to look at is our explained variance. This tells us how much variance is actually meaningful um, and how much is noise. And the most variance you have in something is 100%, of course. Um, and if you or all the variance in your data um, explains real phenomena, then very quickly you'll hit you know, over 90, 100%. Um, if your data is very, very noisy and there's not real information in there, um, this will kind of Peter patter and not get very high very quickly, unless you have just very complicated data. Now in this case, it looks like two principal components um, describes about 96% of your, your variation in your data, which is pretty good um, in spectroscopic data. Um, and we tend to look at our scores and our loadings side by side. The loadings is which individual variables contribute to that particular principal component, which direction it's in. Um, so we can see that principal component one um, really has some issues in these tailing ends. Um, to me, that doesn't really look like true information. There's just some like strange variation in there. Um, so we may want to look at reducing our variables as well. If we look at principal component two, um, it's kind of interesting. It looks sort of like a first derivative um, shapes in a way, but you can see that there's particular wavelength ranges that have more information than others. These don't really impact um, what's going on in these data, even in principal component one, right? So what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to mark my variables with a rectangle. I'm going to cut out those little ends and some of the middle part, because this seems to be the area that has the most uh, chemical meaning. And just to confirm in principal component two. Now, in spectroscopic data, we don't want to completely remove these wavelengths because they're, um, if we remove them, then these butt up against each other and we, it's a little bit harder to interpret where things are in your full spectrum. And I'm actually going to do reverse marking. Okay, so now these parts that I don't want are marked and we're going to right click in our navigation pane and say recalculate with marked down weighted. Basically, that's going to take each of those variables that are marked, multiply it by a very teeny number so that they aren't affecting your analysis. But they still show up in the loadings kind of as a placeholder. Okay. 
right? All right. Now we see that um, very clearly that one and two, it's a, it's a very sharp, nice thing. And we've got a little bit more variance um, explained without those noisy edges that didn't have real meaning. This looks much more like a spectrum. Um, and if you notice, this looks principal component one now looks very similar to principal component two in the original case. Okay, and then we've got principal component two. It's almost like they switched, um, which makes sense um, because this looks more like a spectrum than principal component two did to me, at least. Now we're going to put a hoteling t-squared ellipse on here just to kind of get an idea. Um, this is a 95% confidence interval. Interval. We'd expect that most of our data is going to fall in here and about 5% is going to be out. Um, this one's close to the edge, um, but it's probably fine. Uh, this is normal behavior of your data. Now, since we're going to want to do a regression, what we can do is some sample grouping here uh, to see if we have any uh, trends falling out. If we right click, we can do sample grouping. And what I'm going to do is first look at component A. I'm going to create row sets. So what this does is creates um, groups based on even uh, ranges over the full range of whatever component A is. I'm going to pull those over. And what we see here is we've got low in A are the blue, medium in A are the red, the next one is green, this light blue, and then um, a higher range. Um, so we can see there is kind of a trend that gives us a clue that it may be fairly reasonable to be able to do a regression model on this particular uh, component. And we can look at this and says that, okay, since this is low in A, that means that when this peak is more in this direction, then it's saying that it's lower in A. So as this peak disappears, then you're actually getting more A. And as this peak appears, um, you're going to get more of A. So it's kind of reversed um, than you would normally think in this particular case. Now let's take a look at sample grouping for component B. We're going to clear this. B, create the row sets, and apply. Now what we see here, especially in these first two principal components, is it's kind of a mess. There's no real trend. You've got um, all these ranges everywhere. Um, and we really don't want to go more than component two because we don't get any extra information. So it could be that Raman is not a good approach for measuring B in this particular case. Um, and that's what the Unscrambler helps you see very quickly rather than trying to force um, a square peg into a round hole, right? You can see very quickly and easily that maybe this isn't the right tool for that particular measurement. So let's go back, and I'm actually going to run our PLS now. Tasks, Analyze, Partial Least Squared. Apologize, it's a little slow because we've got 11,000 data points that we're looking at. Um, so my computer doesn't like me at the moment. Um, you do want to be careful when you have large data sets like this. Um, I know there's only a few samples, but there's a lot of variables. Um, you want to make sure to keep your project size small. Um, the more uh, nodes that you have here, the more models, the more uh, matrices that you have in here, the more memory it's going to use, and it's going to make the analysis run a little bit slower. And if something goes wrong, um, then you lose a lot of data and information. So we're going to do, make sure that you're using the right preprocessing. We want to predict, I'm actually going to do, I'm going to predict them both together um, just to see A and B just for some time purposes. And then we're going to use our spectra 
And now what I want to do, because we're doing a PLS2, and if you look here, you can see that product A and product B are slightly different scales. It's not a huge difference, um, but just to make sure that you're not biasing your analysis by one or the other, I'm going to do a weighting of our Y variables. We're going to select all. And we're going to apply this, so it takes the mean and then divides by the standard deviation of the spectra. Update, and then we'll say go. It's just putting them on even footing, so you don't force it to try to fit one uh, variable better than the other. All right. Well, this looks like a mess, right? <laughs> so we've got... Um, you look at our explained variance, and it looks like oh, we can only really look at one factor in this case um, because of whatever's going on here. Um, and we're only explaining about 57% of the data. Now, this is going to be for product A, um, and these are our regression coefficients for one factor. Let me change this to a line. And mark those, okay? So those reg regression coefficients look very much like principal component one, as we saw in the principal component analysis, so that's good to notice that. Um, and then just to confirm, we can look at the next, looks like we don't add any more information by going to extra factors, and definitely by factor four, we're getting very noisy, and you see that's where these validations really drop off. Um, so we also want to look at our RMSE and our R squared, and you can see our target line, and it's, the closer these lines are to that black line, the more uh, accurate a prediction you have, and the closer these points are to that line is going to drop your RMSE. So it looks like, you know, here at the middle we're trying to predict uh, 2.9 and we've got an error of about 1.7, so that's given me an error of, oops, let me do this the right way. This is just sort of my quick check that I look at. I look at my RMSE divided by the center value, and so we're looking at about a 5 or 6 percent error, um, but we're still only explaining um, 57% of the variance in Y, which isn't very good. Uh, let me go back. I feel like I did this earlier and it did better. Not sure why. Let's um, do a sample grouping here for product A. And you can see you have a couple of products that are overlapping here. So this kind of shows you that maybe this isn't the best way to approach it, but you can still get sort of a general trend. Um, it really depends on how accurate you need to be for your particular um, solution, uh, whether this is, can replace your uh, solution or not. I wouldn't be too happy with this personally. Um, definitely in the pharmaceutical world, you wouldn't like this. Um, if you're looking more at something in um, sensory analysis, um, then it might be okay. But uh, for this particular case, I would say that this is not a very good approach. Um, if we also look at what product B looks like, product B is just all over the place. There's no real uh, correlation between, you know, your predicted and your output. So definitely for product B, it's not explaining your data at all. So if we go here, if we right click and we look at variances in RMCP, if we do X or Y variance, we can split these out. and it's thinking. I'm 
apologize. Let's see if I can't free up some space here. And this is a clear example of why you need to be careful about your sizes sometimes. And we're having issues. All right, well, let me just go forward in our PowerPoint presentation then. <clears throat> so we talked about looking at the line plot to pull some data out, um, using descriptive statistics to analyze your data. Um, to get an idea of what you want to what sort of pre-processing you want to do, uh, scattering effects. Um, in your principal components, just to kind of remind people what the algebra looks like, this is your data matrix. Um, you get your scores, so you're going to have a score for each individual object or sample. And then your loadings, you're going to have a value for each um, component for each variable um, plus this error block. Um, so this is the part that contains your structure and this is the part that contains your error. And you, um, and you basically want to get rid of as much of your noise as possible. When you're looking at spectroscopic data, um, the first thing you're going to do is uh, mean center, like a lot of things, so you get rid of your average spectrum so that the first uh, principal component actually can explains the most amount of change in your data, you want to make sure that your components look like spectra um, and that you can come find some chemical meaning to them. Um, and then if it starts to look kind of like noise, it's probably noise and you don't want to go any further, you would stop taking principal components into account. Um, again, you want to assess your loadings, um, same sort of thing. This is where you're seeing the major changes in this particular spectra. So this is probably the one you care about the most, is this principal component one. There's a couple of little changes happening in principal component two, and then this starts to look very noisy, so you would leave that out. You assess your scores. Um, your sample should be symmetrically distributed unless um, you're looking at a discrimination type analysis <clears throat> or classification, then you want to have tight groups very far away from each other. Um, and use your scores plot to look for um, groups and also outliers. You can also, um, for Robin, it's often used in process, so you can follow a batch process to see um, like a drying. Um, this could be a drying, um, well not for Raman, but for NIR, right? You can follow the process, maybe a reaction in Raman. You can say, I'm starting with uh, one product, uh, the reaction components, and as we go towards the end, then we come to the end point, um, and I know that I don't need to go any further. Um, so just a quick summary and suggested workflow. You import your data, create your category variables, set your variable sets and sample sets, um, inspect and plot your data, do your statistics, um, look at your line plot, histograms, uh, to see if you need to pre-process the data in any way. Do your principal components analysis just to get a general idea of what's going on, a, a picture of your data. And this is where you might see your groups, your outliers, to determine if you want to do a classification or a regression model. Um, and then you're going to do calibration and validation. Uh, with some feasibility studies to determine which pretreatment is optimal. Once you decide on your pretreatment, you optimize your model, determine how to make components, if you want to select particular wavelengths. You validate, always validate. Um, if you don't validate, then your model's no good because you can't say how good it is or how bad it is. Um, and then you interpret your final model. And then finally, you can use that model to predict new samples. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can take that now. Let's 
see if this, ah, this has come back. I can show you now. If we look at our Y variables, ah, here we go. Typically, do you do smoothing first, then SNV, or the reverse? So, depending on the type of smoothing you're doing, it shouldn't really matter. Um, I think I tend to do smoothing first, uh, because you'll see very quickly that there's a lot of noise. Um, and so you want to smooth that out before you do uh, your SNV, because basically the SNV takes the mean of your entire spectrum, subtracts that from each individual variable, and then uh, Uh, divides by the standard deviation. So yeah, it would make sense to do your smoothing first. I believe that you said the average spectra should be removed so that PC1 is meaningful. How is this done? All right, so that's actually done automatically by Unscrambler. Um, when we go analyze the principal components analysis, there's a default check here that says mean center data. Um, and that's where that's going to be. Uh, we pretty much always leave that checked. Uh, there may be rare cases where you don't want to mean center, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, and so what that does is it subtracts the mean of your data. So that's going to subtract your mean spectrum. Okay, so what I wanted to show here with this explained variance is that, so in this case, we've got the... The blue and the red here are the global model, so that's the PLS2. So that's the explained variance of both A and B. Now, if we crank over and we look just at product A, you can see product A actually is described very pretty well um, by one component, right? So you've got 87% of your variance is you know, which is better than the global model. So that tells me, again, as I suggested, that it's possible that um, this method is fine for looking at just component A but not component B. If we go look at component B, you see it's just kind of a disaster here. Um, right away you can't predict at all and we could see that from our predicted versus reference as well. So let me do a quick thing real quick. So now that we've discovered that it's not good for product B, let's just do a PLS on only product A. If my unscrambler would respond. Okay, so please tell me more about PLSR for two correlated variables. Um, if your correlated variables are, or if your variables are correlated, then you'll either have good prediction for both or not good prediction for both. Um, and so you can use a single model for both. Um, in this case, these were completely, un you know, these were fairly uncorrelated. So, um, that's why sometimes the global model isn't the best approach. Um, so, okay, we might be able to use uh, Raman for product A, as I said, but not for product B, and you need to go to a different measurement for product B. So we're going to do just A and our spectra, say so, okay. Ah, now we're going a little faster. All right, so now we see very quickly that doing the global model was the incorrect approach for this particular data, um, but doing a single model for just product A um, does really well. Our R squared is almost, it's very close to one, it's almost over 95.95, and our errors are very low compared to what we have here. Um, so we're getting down to, let's see, 0.1 divided by 
um, maybe a 3% error. Um, that's really good. That's acceptable in almost all um, states, right? And that's, in that case, we're using a five-factor model, I would not do that. Um, this is where you need to take your own knowledge into account. That's why we look at the explained variants. Um, you don't get much extra information after PC1, actually, right? PC1 explains 90% of your data. You're going up to five factors here. That's starting to look like noise, and you can see that in our regression coefficients as well, right? This looks really noisy. Um, if we come back to factor one, this looks much more like a spectrum. Um, so we'll go ahead and pull this back. And we still have a very good uh, correlation and error in this particular case. Are there any other questions about this data? Oh, this is a good question. Um, so it says, we often have Raman data with pretty different X values um, due to using resonance Raman with freely tunable laser. <clears throat> so even though we are looking at the same spectral range, we do not get data points at the same wave numbers. How much of a difference can the interpolate take when importing this data? Um, that's something I'm going to have to get back to you. Um, I'm for what I'm aware of, it's, you know, only in the, uh, like, tens and hundreds of digits, but um, I can find out, and I'll definitely email everyone in the group uh, the answer to that question. Thank you for that. So we still have a little bit of time. I'm going to show you quickly, if I can, some interesting data for, uh, identification purposes. Let's see. Media. I'm not going to walk you through this whole thing, but I'm going to show you how you can do classification on some spectra. Um, so what we have here is a bunch of spectra of different types of media that things are grown in. Um, so I have a category variable that we're going to try to classify based on some Raman data. Now what I did first, and I can do this part really quickly, was a principal components analysis. And very quickly, clear that. We can create row sets based on those category variables to see if it's possible to use this as a classification method. Now, what I see here is a lot of stuff. So it looks like we have a couple of groups that are separated from each other, but there are a couple that are overlapping with each other. Um, so what I did is I actually came in here, and I'll do one quick example, and I'm going to mark everything that is M0518, okay, and I can build a PCA model just based on those data. We go in here, right click, recalculate with mark samples, it'll hold everything else the same, and then could make a model just based on that. You can rename that, so that was M0518. Right? Once you have a bunch of these models for each individual ones, we can go in and do a predict classification, Simca. We want to look at our media spectra. Um, and I actually did some pre-processing on these that I'm not showing at the moment. Um, but then we bring each of these models in for all the different classes that we care about. And we want to look at our spectra. Ugh, sorry about that.
All right, say OK. <clears throat> and we got here is a classification plot. So basically it looks at each sample and how it wound up classifying them. What you ideally want is only one asterisk per sample, right? So this spectrum is clearly identified as being H6136 and nothing else. Um, if you have some ambiguities, you'll see this. Um, I'm going to bring this down to a different uh, level of accuracy. And once we get down to this being 25% or 75% confident that it's within that group, um, then we see that um, everything that is H6136 is properly classified. And you can't see them there. Oh, here we go. H316, those are properly classified. The M50518 are properly classified, and there's no ambiguities. But there is some ambiguity between these two and these two. Um, so what you can do then is say, OK, I know that this particular way using Simca will separate out these particular things, um, but not these. And then you can set up a hierarchical system of separating them out. And we have a way of doing that as well. And I'm not going to show you now, but we'll do that in a later webinar. Um, once you do the hierarchical modeling, we actually get perfect classification except for, I think, one of these samples, which may be one of these ones that kind of stands out. Um, I think it may be this one. Um, so anyway, I believe that's all that we have for today, and I hope that was helpful for everyone. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hbrook with an E at camo.com. Um, and thank you again for your time and your questions today. Have a great time. Day.